you for this congregation. I thank you for people who have hearts and willingness to listen. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Uh, we've been going over a sermon series called The Missional Church. And um, last week, uh, Brian gave it a, a really, um, I, I was very moved by a sermon on social justice. Um, and today, we're actually going to talk about unity. Um, and so, uh, we're actually going on about what it means to be a missional church. What are the attributes of what a missional church should look like? Uh, and today, we're actually going to talk about a church that focuses on unity. Now, it's very strange that that actually coincides. I didn't do this on purpose, but we're actually talking about unity in a time where we feel like our country is very divided. And so, um, you know, I'm going to get to that later on in a bit. But um, yeah, so I, I really, I really kind of struggled with this this past week. I said, how, how am I going to give a, a sermon or a message on unity at a time like this, where, where it just feels like we're just not united together as a country? You know, and I thought, well, where's the church's place and role in all of this? And so um, today we're going to look at a passage in the book of Philippians. And um, before we get into the passage, I want to give you a brief background information on the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians is actually a very unique letter in the epistles. And the reason why that is, is because most of the time when you have Paul writing to these places, you have tension. Of, of racial tension. It's, for example, you have tension of, of the, the, the Jews and, and the non-Jews, or sometimes the Jews and the Greeks, who have very different types of philosophy and the way that they do things. Those are typical types of tensions that you have when you see Paul writing these letters, these epistles. But the church in, in Philippi, Philippi is actually a northern region of Greece, which back then they called Macedonia. And, and during that time period, it, it was pretty homogenous. It was, it was mostly Greek people. And so you don't have the same types of problems and issues that you would normally see when you're looking at one of these epistles, right? One of these letters. You don't have the cultural clashing of two cultures that are totally different coming together. You have a pretty homogenous society that comes together in the church in Philippi. And so you would think that, okay, maybe in this church they have everything together. There's less problems, less issues, but yet that, for some reason that is not the case. In fact, when you look at Philippians chapter 4, you see, you see factions. You see these two women that are, that, are, that are very influential, and suddenly they have these factions and groups, and, and, and they're, they're causing these divisions. And you see all kinds of, of, of problems with divisions going on in the church in Philippi, which ironically is a homogenous church, which tells me that unity goes beyond really just our differences. It, it, it cuts to the core of our heart. That unity is a heart problem. It's an individual heart problem that we each individually have. That unity is so much more multi-layered than simply differences. That there's something going on. There's something that it tells us. It's something that that lack of unity tells us about the hearts of people in the church. And so today, I, I want to I take a look at the passage that, that Paul actually tells the church in Philippi. And this is what he says. He says, therefore... If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in, his, in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Now, this is a, to the naked eye, this is a very straightforward passage, right? I mean, it's just kind of unity, unity, unity all over it. And if you look at the passage, they have all these unity keywords. It says, what does it say? It says, if you're encouragement being united with Christ, you know, and, 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 and common sharing in the spirit, and then and, and, and being complete, and being like-minded, and having same love, and one spirit, and one mind. If we were to take a look at this passage with the naked eye, it seems very straightforward. <clears throat> It's just a passage about unity. It's just a passage about everybody having things together and being the same. But then there, there's a part that, that kind of seems a little bit out of place in the midst of all these unity themes, right? You have all these unity type words and togetherness type words. But it says in the, in the first sentence, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, kind of seems out of place, right? All the united and being same and like-minded and one and then comfort from his love. What, is, what does that have to do with anything? What does what is having comfort from Jesus Christ's love have to do with being united? And today I actually want to tell you, and I wanna, um, normally we, we give the answers at the end of the sermon, but today, <laughs> that's the answer. 
It's everything. It has everything to do with being united. Everything. That's that's everything. In fact, um, I'm a pretty. I think I'm a pretty opinionated person, right? I, I I think the two most opinionated people in the world, two most opinionated professions, are lawyers and pastors. And at one point, I was both of them. So I'm some kind of like a freak of an opinionated person, right? Like I'm just this very uh, annoying person sometimes, and. Um, that's me. So yeah, I, 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 I remember I used to be, I used to just have an opinion on everything. Now I'm, I'm a little more tired, so it's, it's harder, all right? But I, I used to just have an opinion on every little thing. And I remember when I was at my previous church, uh, I was youth pastoring at my previous church, which I like to call my home church because that's where I grew up, um, church in Jackson Heights. And that's where I was youth pastoring. And when I was youth pastoring there, I, I had an opinion about every single thing about the church. Right? In fact, I had an opinion on every single thing about the way they ran the church. And I used to, I used to, I, at one point it just got so frustrating that every week it was about like, like lobbying for my constituents. That's what it was about every single week. And I used to go into church with like fight music in the background. Just, you know, just, you know, sometimes just like war music. Just like, okay, I got like Braveheart bagpipes, just, you know, just playing in the background. Just, I would walk into church and, and I'd be like, okay, it's time for me to like fight for my constituents. Freedom, you know, like, it's time for me to like go at it and, 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 you know, make sure that the church is taking care of these people. And so I, I would just complain and I was so frustrated. I said, why aren't they investing in the next generation? Why is more budget going overseas when we're not looking after their kids here? And why is this happening? And why is that happening? And why is there never heat in the youth group sanctuary? I don't know, I don't know if you've ever been to a youth group in America, but I've never seen or been inside a youth group in America that has heat in the sanctuary. And I don't know why that is, but it's the saddest sight. If you want to see like a sad sight, just walk into it and they're all just like, in bubble jackets, just <laughs> it's just so sad. Like, I don't know why. Is it part of the training process? I don't know what that is, but nobody ever gives youth group kids heat. I don't know why that is. And so I would just complain, like why are they just letting these kids shiver all winter long? And, and it was just, Constant complaining and complaining and frustration and frustration. And then I remember I was talking to one of my good friends, and, and um, I'll just call him Rob. Now, Rob is not a Christian. But Rob is one of the most interesting people I know. Um, because to me, he's, he's kind of like, he's one of the smartest people I ever met. Uh, he's not a Christian, but he's, he's interested and he's exploring, he's exploring uh, various religions. The reason why I like talking to Rob <laughs> is because Rob is, is one of the rare uh, non-Christians that doesn't have a, a, a bias against Christianity. So that's why I like talking to Rob, because Rob actually gives me a lot of objective views on how Christians are perceived and then how I can better myself as a pastor. So it's really interesting. I love talking to him. He's actually, I get the most feedback from, from Rob, actually, because I, I want to become a better pastor, obviously. I want to become a better Christian and light to this world. So talking to someone like Rob, who's, who's a non-Christian, who's able to see things objectively and not curse me out, is, oh, it's really good. It's really good. So I was talking to Rob, and and, and I was complaining to Rob, I said, you know, Rob, they're, they're, just, they're, they're, they're spending all this money on this, and kids aren't getting heat, all this stuff, and, and I'm going at it, and I'm talking to Rob, and I'm just kind of like, you know, leching every, like, you know, just like, kind of just regretting, you know, just like taking everything out on Rob, like, Rob, you know, Rob, what, what is wrong with the church today? I'm going at it, at it, at it, at it, at it, and he says, David, you know, I, I just want you to know, um, and this is actually a few days afterwards. He said, David, I just want you to know, because you want to be a better pastor, right? I said, yeah. I, said, I want you to know how you're being perceived right now. I want you to know how, how I see you right now. And don't take any offense to this. But he said, David, you come off right now as very arrogant. And that blew my mind. Because I, I had no idea. I said, Whoa, 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 obviously, what's the first thing I did? I got defensive. So, whoa, whoa, hold on, man, hold on. I said, you haven't seen some of these other dudes, man. They're really bad. And I started talking about, like, some of the other, no, these guys complain more than I do, and, and, and they're worse than I am. He says, Rob, and Rob says to me, he says, Dave, as a, as a non-Christian, looking at this objectively, what do I care about these other people? Because I'm talking to you right now, and I'm telling you that you're coming off very arrogant. And that, that really, really... Um, it was really eye-opening when you told me that. In fact, I went through this period where after I actually um, stepped down from youth ministry and I left the church, um, I, I was able to look at the church more objectively, that church, and I saw the amazing things that that church was doing. 
that I could not see. I was so blind to it. I, I saw the amazing things that they were doing. I saw, I saw the, the missionaries that they were supporting. I, 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 saw, I saw all the, 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 how they were making an impact locally and, and, and doing uh, congregations for the local people. And, and I, I saw all the amazing things. But the crazy thing that was, I could not see that while I was there. My heart was just too dark. It was just in a place of darkness. I was not in the comfort of his love. I was in a place where I needed to be right. I was in a place of pride and arrogance. And this is where Rob really hit me. This is what Rob says to me. And this is, he, he starts educating me on, on, on the history of Christianity, which is kind of funny, you know, because at the time I was in seminary. And he's educating me on the history of Christianity. And he says it better than I've ever, ever, ever heard it before. But he says, David, I'll tell you why um, Christians are kind of ironic to me. He says, okay, so before Jesus Christ, the religious people of the time were extremely prideful and arrogant, right? That was the culture of the religious people at the time. They were extremely arrogant and prideful people. And, and he says, and what ends up happening is Jesus Christ comes and he, and he starts his movement. He dies on the cross, resurrects, and people witness that. And all of a sudden, it's not about people. It's not about you. It's about this event that took place that cleansed our sins. And so all of a sudden, in the first century, church, you have a religion and you have a movement that's like nothing else because it's not about us and what we're doing, but instead it's about an event that took place. And so you have humble Christians or, or you have a, a movement that's based on humility for the first time, right? And so he's, he's like, it's, it's a beautiful thing at first. We see this beautiful thing at first because people are just reminding each other that no, it's not about you, it's not about, it's about Jesus Christ. And then what happens in Christian history around the fourth century Christianity gets decriminalized, which, you know, it's a good thing. Um, and then the Emperor Constantine, you know, he, he spreads Christianity and then they call him the Council of Nicaea and, and all these bishops come together. And th this is a these are in itself a beautiful thing, right? For the first time, Christians of different opinions and backgrounds get to come together and just kind of discuss Christianity. But then he says, but, but something funny happens at that point. All of a sudden, Christians start getting arrogant again. All of a sudden, it's no longer based on what Jesus Christ did. Everybody's trying to fight each other about who's right and who's right and who has the right answer and who's theologically correct. And all of a sudden, you now you have Christian divisions and, and you have things that, 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 that just start ugly, ugly nature of Christianity. And people start getting turned off because Christians are so divided. They're, they're, they're so hateful towards each other. They're so hateful towards other groups. And all of a sudden, he says, this is what he says. He says, Christians have now turned right back into the people they were before Jesus Christ came. And he says that's most of Christian history, even till this day. That blew my mind. That blew my mind. When he said that, that really just, it, it really humbled me. And, and, and it brought me to a place where I kind of came into a little bit of a funk, a, a good funk. It wasn't a bad funk, it was a good funk. Because I came into the place where I said, maybe I don't always have to be right. Maybe I don't always have to know all the answers. And I remember I was just, during that time period, I was hanging out with a lot of seminary students and pastors. And I have, I'm, I'm probably like one of the rare guys who, I have, I have a very wide range of seminary student friends and pastors, right? I have Pentecostal friends, I have Presbyterian friends, I have Methodist friends, I have Baptist friends. I have friends all across the board, and, and everybody thinks they're right. So I'm listening to them, and I'm trying to listen to them, and they all think they're 100% right about every single thing. And I'm listening to them, and I'm going through this period of funk. This is about three years ago. I'm going to this period of funk, and I'm like, I'm, I'm like, and, and they're so certain that they're right. And I'm thinking, well, if you just went to that school instead of that school, you'd be on this side. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went to that. I was just like, how do I even process all this? And it, it brought me to a place where I was just kind of like, I don't know anything anymore. And, and all I know is I just want to spend time with Jesus. And so when I read the Bible, for the first time, I wasn't reading the Bible to show off my knowledge to people. I wasn't reading the Bible because I wanted to I wanted to know more so that I could become a better Christian. I was reading the Bible for one reason and one reason alone. I just wanted to spend time with Jesus. And see, that's why, that's ultimately the reason why we read the Bible. We read the Bible to spend time with Jesus. We don't read the Bible so we can become know-it-alls. We don't read the Bible because we don't have all the answers. We read the Bible because we can spend time with Jesus so that Jesus can speak to us. That's ultimately why we read the Word. In fact, um, John Piper, for those of you who know John Piper, um, he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's a Reformed theologian, extremely intellectual guy, one of the smartest people that, that, I, that I've heard. Um, and this is actually what he says because he, he, he's, um, 
He's a very intellectual-based preacher. And in an interview, they asked Sean Piper, they said, what is, are some of the dangers of, a, of an intellectual-based Christian movement? Now, I'm not speaking against an intellectual-based Christian movement. That's not what I'm doing today. I'm just saying this is his response to what they, uh, what they said. This is what some of the dangers they said. This is, my caution concerns making theology God instead of God. Loving doing theology rather than loving God. And you might love thinking about God more than you love God. Or defending God more than you love God. Or writing about God more than you love God. Or preaching more than you love God. Or evangelizing more than you love God. The kind of person that is prone to systemize and fit things together like me is wired dangerously to begin to idolize the system. We should be intellectually and emotionally more engaged with the person of Christ, the person of God, the Trinity, than we are thinking about Him. Thinking about God, once again, this is not a bad thing, and engaging with Him, once again, it's not a bad thing, are inextricably woven together. But the reason why you are reading the Bible and the reason why you are framing thoughts about God from the Bible is to make your way through those thoughts to the real person. You see, if we're not spending time in the comfort of His love, it doesn't mean anything. If we're not spending time with Jesus Christ, if we're not reading the Bible to get to Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean anything. I know it sometimes feels like it does, but it doesn't. Because we need to get to the comfort of His love once again. That's what it's all about. You know what I realized? One of my dreams in life um, is to watch sports with my son. Right? And he's only three years old, and I'm trying to speed that process up as much as possible. <laughs> and, 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 and so I, I just want him to you know, sit on that couch and watch sports with me. I want him to just, just sit there and, and sit through and watch like the, the Nets, I mean the Knicks and, and the Mets <laughs> and, and the Jets. I just want him to sit there and just suffer with me through these horrible teams and, and just be there with me, you know? And so. I tried. He's three years old now. I tried. I, I brought him and, and, and I said, hey, let's watch this. And I started teaching him about basketball. Right? And I said, okay, look, uh, when you shoot from all the way out there, that's three points. You know? And then when you shoot from inside here, that's two points. And you know, when someone hits you, you get free throws, so you get two shots. And I'm teaching him all this and going on and on. After all that, he looks at me and goes, this basketball? And, and I'm like... Yes, it's basketball. Let's start. Okay, let's start over from square one. Okay, this is basketball, and the ball goes in the hoop, right? And I realized that he's three. Like he's not mentally like prepared to know everything, to be right about everything, right about basketball. His mind does not work like that. And yet, in First Corinthians chapter thirteen, why are we so arrogant? Because it says that our minds are like children compared to the mind of God. And that, that we think like children compared to the mind of God. And why are we trying to always be right? Why is it so necessary for us to be right? Once again, I'm not saying that we don't, we're don't. we not trying to figure things out as Christians. I'm not saying just suddenly cease to do that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is why is more of our identity in being right about everything than being in the comfort of His love? Amen. You see, if we were in the comfort of His love, we would be more united as a church. We wouldn't have had the great schism back in the 11th century because everybody just wanted to be right and it was more about being right than respecting each other and acknowledging each other and loving each other. And that everything was about being right. That, that was, you see, the first step in the body, in the unity, in the body of Christ is being in the comfort of His love. If we want to be united together as a church, we need to be in the comfort of His love. You see, that way, even if there are things that we may not disagree about, those things don't hold our identity. What really holds our identity together is Christ. That's how we can become united as a church. We need to be united in the body of Christ. What is the first commandment? It says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is the greatest commandment that was ever given to us. Um, so, Christian Hernandez is the lead pastor of Hope Story. I love Christian. He's like my brother. Um, Christian is the most unique pastor uh, in all of the Hope Church Network, in, in a way, because he's the only lead pastor of a Hope Church that didn't plant that church. Right, so he, he took over the church, uh, he succeeded the church when Julie Hyun stepped down. 
So he's the only one out of us that, that didn't find the church, which means that he actually, you know, loves people. <laughs> well, I mean, we love people too, but uh, that means that he, he <laughs> that means that he, you know, he, he's a pastor. I'm a pastor too, but he, he's, he's, he's like a pastor, pastor, you know what I mean? Like no strings attached pastor, you know? Like he did it because he's a pastor, pastor, you know? And, and, um, and we kind of drive him nuts sometimes. That's why I love having Christian around because he, he really kind of humbles me at times. Um, because, you know, planters, we're like pastors, but we're also like planters, right? So, you know, we also kind of have this, like, ambition, this, you know, thing. And, and to him, that's, like, the saddest thing. So <laughs> sometimes we're, like, discussing, and we're going on and on, and then he's like, do you guys ever pray? You know, like, <laughs> and he'll be just kind of like, come on, guys. And, and, and a lot of times he'll call me out on that, which is a good thing. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. I, I love the fact that he can call me out on, on that. And this is what Christian says. Christian was actually, um, he, was, he was asked to speak at a, at a church planters gathering of like 150 church planters. Isn't this awesome? So he was actually asked to speak at a church planters gathering, and they, they purposely got Christian as like the, the, um, the, the, the starting preacher to kind of set the mode. And Christian, like, he, he gave this sermon that just like blew everybody's mind. It blew everybody's mind, right? And as he sat there, like, I never saw 150 pastors so humbled. Like, we're all just kind of like looking down, like, yes, yes. you should just love people. And it should be about spending more time with God, not our ambition. And um, this is what Christian said in the sermon. I actually recorded this. Um, I took it down. It says, ministry fruit is not evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. It is possible to do the work of God without intimacy with God. Look at what he's saying. He's saying that we can build as many churches that we want. He's saying we can, we can, we can grow as, as much as we want. It doesn't mean anything if we're not spending time with him. If we're forgetting our first love, if we're not being intimate with God, then it doesn't mean anything. That's what Christian is saying. I got news for you. Like, like what we're doing here doesn't mean anything if we're not spending time with God. And anybody can gather together as a community. Anybody can gather together and, and, and sing songs and, and listen to inspirational messages. But if we're not putting him as a center of our love, if the whole reason and everything why we're doing this is not because we want to get to know him more and be more intimate with him, then it doesn't really mean anything. The core of everything is we must get to the comfort of his love. But what does this have anything to do with missional church? Right, today's topic is the missional church. What does it have anything to do? It says, well, I'll tell you what. Um, in the middle of this passage, right, it says, If any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. I thought this was a funny thing. I, 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 when I first read this, I didn't think I actually had anything to learn off this part. Uh, but he says, make my joy complete by being like-minded. Like, who cares? <laughs> like, you know, why, why do we care so much that, that your joy is complete? That's what I'm kind of thinking. Like, why is that so important? And I realized, as I was reading this passage, there is rich theological truth to this. Unity affects those that are on the outside. Right? So what, what, what the Apostle Paul is saying is that it actually affects me whether you guys are united or not. That affects me. And what he's saying is that, he says, make my joy complete, that, that people must see that our church is distinct, that the Christian church is distinct, that we're able to do things that the world is not able to do, that we have a common ground and a common love that this world cannot possibly comprehend. You see, that one of the keys to being a missional church and, and being united is that the world must see churches avoiding unnecessary divisions. That is what the Christian church is called to do. The most remarkable form of evangelism of the church today is going to be the church and the quality of our community. That's our number one form of evangelism. If the church see, if outsiders see that the church cannot work things out, that the church is constantly divided, that the church is, the church is just being arrogant people that need to get everything right and divided amongst each other, then that's going to turn the world off. That's going to make their joy not so complete when they see the Christian church today. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about it, but I, we're kind of running low on time. But I do want to, I do want to address um, the presidential election that happened this week. Now, I, I've, I've thought about it, I've prayed about it, um, of how, what, I, what I really am going to say. Um, 
And first, I just want to start off by saying this, because it's important for you guys to know. Um, there's a lot of reasons to vote for somebody and not to vote for somebody. Right? I understand that. Um, I think Christians should understand that. Right? It's not always black and white. Right? There's, and that's one of the things that I think uh, we began to understand. Right? It's not just about race. It's not just about certain issues. It's not just about that. There's just so many various issues all across the board right? that, that resonate with people. Right? And, and then there were certain issues that rural areas resonated more with city areas. And, 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 and all these things, so it's, it's, it's very difficult for us to kind of understand every single person that, that ever voted, right? Like, it's, it's so complex. It's so complex, right? So I, I thought about that, and, and, and that, that in itself doesn't dis, uh, kind of disappoint me or discourage me. I think here's what kind of discourages me. So, once again, I want to make it clear, right? Whoever you voted for, you know, I think I think as a church we should be understanding of these things, right? And we should have, um, you know, uh, respect and discourse for one another when we talk about these type of things. So this is not this is not about that. I'm not about to talk about that. What I am, what I do want to talk about is that I've noticed um, among friends of mine, among people I've I've encountered within the Christian community. And here's the thing that kind of disturbs me. Um, for those friends of mine or some people that I've come across during this time, what I've realized is that, yes, okay, it's okay to vote based on certain things that you believe have priority and value. I mean, that's okay. That I, you know, maybe I'm not the one to be able to tell you that. Maybe we're not the ones to be able to tell you what you should prioritize and we can. But, I mean, maybe you, you know, you've come to this conviction with God and all that stuff. And that's fine. But here's the thing that I realized. There's been a lot of people that just, just lack empathy. There's been a lot of just cold, cold-hearted Christians during this political climate. See, that's kind of what disturbs me. It's not so much about who you voted for. Though. That's not what I'm trying to talk about. The lack of empathy. You see, I mean, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, the Trump administration during their campaigning, they did marginalize certain groups. They were <laughs> attacking certain groups. And so, once again, I'm not saying you shouldn't have voted for him or anything like that, but what I'm saying is that how can possibly your reaction be after all that as a Christian, as an imitator of Christ, to jump out and be like, yes, we won! I mean, yeah, you might have won certain issues and things like that. That's fine. Once again, that's fine. That's not what I'm saying. Please don't misunderstand me. But, my, but what I'm trying to say is that how do you just completely, 100% ignore all the people that were marginalized and attacked? Like, how is that possible? How can you possibly just say, forget about these people? They're not real souls. How can you possibly be like that? I, I don't understand because at the heart of Christ, as we've read, at the heart of Christian unity is compassion and love. That's what it says in the scripture. So how can we possibly look at a group and just have no compassion and no love for them? That blows my mind. See, at the very least, we as Christians, once again, whatever we've prioritized, that's fine, but at the very least, we should be empathetic. At the very least, we should pray for the marginalized. Because who did Jesus Christ spend most of his ministry time ministering to? The marginalized, the oppressed, the prostitutes, the drunkards, those who are lepers that nobody wants to go near, the sinners. These are the people that Jesus Christ reached out to that his heart really broke for. And we're going to say that we don't care about those people? As a Christian community? That we don't even care about them? So I, 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 Thomas Wilcox, who's a 16th century poet, this is what Thomas Wilcox said about, about the Christian community. Um, if I can uh, just get my clicker to look. He said, do Christ this one favor. For all his love to you, love all his poor saints and churches, the most despised, the smallest, the weakest, even if you don't totally agree with them, they are engraved on his heart. Let them be also on yours. You see, the way that we're going to come together as a Christian community, as the church, is that we're going to start realizing that people are engraved in Christ's heart. Whether you're a Trump supporter, whether you're, you, were, you, you voted for Hillary, we need to look at each other and realize that this person was engraved on Christ's heart. That's the way that we come together. That's the way that we do unity together. 
Because our identity is going to be focused on what he has done and the comfort and his love that he has provided us. You see, too often times, Christians are all about making our identity on what's right and what's wrong. But instead, this is what we need to place as our identity. This is true faith, as Thomas Wilcox continues, to rest upon the everlasting mountains of God's love and grace in Christ and to live continually in the sight of Christ's infinite righteousness and merits. Actually, let's, let's have the worship team come up, but let's leave this up here. Let's leave this up here for a second. And let's look at this. Let's look at this. Can we place our identity in this? Is this our true faith? Our true faith is that our, it's not about our righteousness. It's not so much about us being right, but it's all about Christ's infinite righteousness and merits no matter who we voted for it all just comes out it's not about the righteousness of that it all comes down to the righteousness of christ infinite righteousness and merits let that be clothed upon you let that be clothed upon others in this community and when you look at somebody in this community or even outside of this community let us see that jesus christ has, has wrapped them in his arms and he has placed them and engraved them in his heart. Who are we?